When it comes to rock and roll craziness, Oasis, one of my favourite bands, are right up there for wild antics. But even they do not hold the all-time crown. That goes to the drummer for The Who, Keith Moon. Keith's life contains many really tragic and dark elements, but this video isn't about that side of his life. This documentary is the story of his jokes, pranks and wildly destructive behaviour down through his years with The Who. There can be few other rock stars around whom there are so many rumours, legends and myths. So for today's video I've combed through tons of books, videos and articles from the people who were actually there to try and present to you in one video the very best of the crackpot antics attributed to Keith Moon, the current reigning overlord of rock and roll insanity. And just as a quick and hopefully obvious disclaimer, please do not try to recreate anything described in this video at home. As a direct result of his wild and insane lifestyle, Keith Moon died at 32. So let's keep these hilarious stories as just that. Stories. Keith Moon was born on the 23rd of August 1946 in Wembley, England. For many years he insisted his birthday was actually a year later, but this was just a ruse, as uncovered by Tony Fletcher in his excellent biography, Dear Boy. In his early years at school, Keith did not particularly shine. As the only member of what was to become the Who not to have passed the 11 plus examination, he finished up 1957's Dry Autumn among the failures at Alperton Secondary Modern for boys. He would insist later he was expelled one term before his ordained leaving age of 15. And if that's true, it's not surprising, because by the sounds of it, at school he was much more into jokes and pranks than academic work. According to one of Moon's playmates, you never felt one day he is going to be famous. You felt more likely that he was going to end up in prison. He took to smoking and was caught under the Alperton Station Railway Bridge one lunchtime by the geography teacher, Mr Sladden, whom Keith promptly kicked in the shins for his troubles. On another occasion, Keith locked Mr Sladden in the geography room cupboard. But, apparently, during these teenage years he had already had his epiphany. He already knew what it was he wanted to do. As a 13-year-old sat bolt upright in a cinema seat, he had watched Drum Crazy a romanticised biopic of Gene Krupa, the handsome extrovert leader of a wartime swing band whose daredevilry reinvented the drum kit as a lead instrument. Gene Krupa became a hero and a role model to Keith, a schoolboy half a world away. And so, having left school at 15, Keith was on two missions. Firstly, to learn how to play the drums, and secondly, to cause as much havoc in the process as possible. Outside school he was starting to cause some serious trouble. The police now paid their first visit to 134 Chaplin Road following an incident in which Keith and a friend let the handbrakes off some cars in a parking lot, causing them to roll into the road. 15-year-old Jerry Evans was another early school leaver, and he got to know Keith through the drum department at Paramount Music on Shaftesbury Avenue, where Jerry worked. He and Keith began hanging out outside of work, and here he shares some of his memories of Keith's pranks during that time. Changing trains one day at Baker Street, Keith swiped a bag of coffee beans from the tea bar. Jerry didn't know about it until it was too late. He said, At Baker Street Station they've got this ridiculously steep escalator, and in the rush hour everyone would be queuing up. On this particular day, when we got to the top, Keith emptied this pound of coffee beans and hundreds of them shot off like bullets, and all these people were clutched on the floor, all falling over each other. Even better for Keith, no one got to the top in time to find out who'd done it. Keith laughed all the way home to Wembley. Soon, Keith started taking evening classes to get some qualifications to work in an electronics factory, and after working there for a little while, he'd saved up enough money to purchase his first drum kit. Shortly after, he was able to engage Carlo Little, the drummer for Screaming Lord Such and the Savages, as his drum teacher. But as well, during his teen years as a school leaver, Keith's appetite for destruction had continued to flower. As time passed, Keith was still spending time with Jerry Evans from the drum shop, but their relationship was starting to become strained because Keith's behaviour was just so unrelenting and wild. Jerry had had enough embarrassing encounters to begin becoming weary of his friend. 
A prank Keith found amusing was taking the slow train home from Baker Street, waiting until after it passed through Neesden, usually deserted at this point, and then to start smashing it up. Jerry says he'd run through the whole carriage, tear down all the advertising placards, including the wooden dividers, and he'd pull out all the seats. And at the next stop, Wembley Park, he'd just say, see ya, and be off home, and I'd be going on to the next station. The final straw might well have been the day Keith showed up at the drum shop with an empty snare case and left with a full one, without buying anything. It was one thing stealing for a friend, it was another thing entirely to steal from a friend. As more time passed and Keith's drum lessons started paying off, he began playing with live bands in and around the London area. And for 18 months he became the drummer for a band called The Beachcombers. And during this time, Keith's showmanship really began to develop. Beachcombers guitarist John Scholar remembers a few hilarious incidents out and about with Keith on the road as a teenager. We had some laughs in the Beachcombers. There was a time when a friend managed to get hold of a pantomime horse from the Wembley ice rink. He brought it to one of our shows and Keith loved it. He climbed inside it, fooled around and we couldn't get him out. Keith held on to the pantomime horse's head and took it to some audition we had to do in central London. He spent most of that night inside it, charging around Piccadilly Circus. The whole time Keith was in the beachcombers, it was non-stop laughter. In the red van that carried the beachcombers around the south of England, Keith would wait until Norman, their guitarist, fell asleep. Then he'd tie tufts of the band leader's hair to different instruments, before waking him up with a start and watching the guitarist bring all the equipment down on his head. One night he turned up to a show with a hunter's duck call, which the others knew nothing about until halfway through one of Ron's ballads, at which point a highly convincing quack ensured that the song collapsed. But that was nothing compared to the time Ron made his regular on-stage complaint about Keith's heavy cymbal crashes at the end of a song, to which Keith announced, that's it, I've had enough of you shouting at me. He pulled out a gun and shot the singer. There was a horrified silence and then Keith flashed that grin of his. It was a starting pistol that he'd got his hands on. Just a jape. Anyone would think they'd never seen a 17 year old with a gun before. But Keith's time with the Beachcombers was only the warm up before the main act. An up and coming band called The Who had just fired their previous drummer following a fallout with guitarist Pete Townsend. Before changing their name to The Who, they had been The Detours, and Keith had been to see them live many times at their regular gig on Thursday nights. Keith was only playing part-time with The Beachcombers, and he realised that this was his chance to go full-time. In Melody Maker, Keith said, They were a bit frightening and I was scared of them. Obviously, they'd been playing together for a few years and it showed. But I asked the manager of the club to introduce me. Tell me about uh, your first meeting of the other guys. Oh, <laughs> well, they were playing at a pub. I just dropped in for a drink, and I was speaking to the uh, manager of the club, and he said that they were looking for a new drummer, and that the guy that was playing with them wasn't their regular drummer, and they were holding auditions. So I said, you want to go along to one? And so I, I sat in. Started. Yeah, I sat in and demolished the guy's drum kit that he'd had for about 50 years, and uh, it just fell to bits, and they said, well, OK, we'll pick you up tomorrow. Bring your own kit next time. Singer Roger Daltrey said this of Keith's audition. Keith always claimed he was never officially asked to join the band, but I remember clearly at the end of that gig telling him we'd pick him up next week. That means you've got the job, mate. It was April 1964, and that was the last time our lineup changed until the 7th of September 1978. Keith was the last in, and he was the first out, bless him. He gave us 14 years of headaches and laughter, in more or less equal measure. It was in the autumn of 1964 that the destructive forces simmering just below the surface in The Who began to break out on stage, initially focused on destroying their instruments. Here's how the instigator, Pete Townsend, remembers that night. At The Who's first show in the Railway Hotel in Harrow, West London, I felt invincible. I violently thrust my guitar into the air, and I felt a terrible shudder as the sound went from a roar to a rattling growl. I looked up to see my guitar's broken head as I pulled it away from the hole I'd punched in the low ceiling. It was at this moment that I made a split second decision, and in a mad frenzy I thrust the damaged guitar up into the ceiling over and over again. What had been a clean break became a splintered mess. 
I held the guitar up to the crowd triumphantly and then threw it carelessly to the ground. I picked up my brand new Rickenbacker 12 string and continued the show. As legend has it, the next week a bigger crowd turned up in anticipation of a repeat performance. However, when Townsend failed to oblige, the half-hearted audience response caused Keith Moon at the end of the show to kick over his entire kit. The following week, the crowd had grown even larger and more agitated in their expectations. This time, Townsend and Moon both obliged by trashing their gear at the climax of the set, in the process creating one of rock's most enduring, fascinating and often imitated, but never bettered, rituals. It was in 1965 that the career of The Who really began to take off. They released their second single, which was the first one actually under the name The Who, I Can't Explain. In January 1965, Keith appeared on national television for the first time, performing that song on Ready Steady Go. Eventually, I Can't Explain climbed to number 8 in the UK. The band's first official release under the name The Who had been a smash hit. Though they were now becoming nationally recognised for their music, The Who were also just as notorious for the tensions between the band members. One particular early flashpoint was between singer Roger Daltrey and Keith the drummer. According to Pete Townsend, Roger tried to befriend Keith, but Keith kept his distance. He also seemed to see Roger's success in pulling girls at our gigs as a challenge. They sometimes chased the same girls in those early days, and it was never clear to me who was winning. Moon's nemesis within the group was Roger Daltrey. Roger was not liked by Keith at all, said Chris Stamp. They were bitter enemies. Roger got the girls, Roger was the singer. He was in front of Keith most of the time. He got all the stuff, and Keith wasn't getting that. In fact, it wasn't just Keith who was sensing a certain amount of animosity from Roger Daltrey. Roger was kind of growing apart from the entire band. It was turning into a kind of a three versus one situation. And a major contributing factor to this was that Roger Daltrey wasn't taking drugs, and the other three were. Roger Daltrey was into working out, he was into women, he was into taking care of his body, whereas the other three were pretty much pill-popping maniacs. In the NME in 1965, Roger said, Arguments? Sure, we have them all the time. It kind of sharpens us up. If we were always friendly and matey, we'd be a bit soft. But we're not mates at all. And Roger goes into a little more detail about the tension between him and Keith in his autobiography. I was already having to contend with Keith and his flying drumsticks. The first flash of recognition, and he had become the pin-up of The Who. Wherever we went, all the girls were screaming, Keith, Keith, Keith. He loved being loved, which you can't blame him for at all. The problem was that I had to stand in front of him. I was the front man, it was my job. And Keith decided the drummer should be at the front. To make his point, he would throw drumsticks at the back of my head, all night, every night. When the flying drumsticks didn't work, he became the master of upstaging. He was fabulous at it. He would do anything to steal the limelight. As Roger says, Keith was very much the celebrity pin-up in his own right. In June 1965, he was interviewed for the NME, and you can get a kind of idea of where he was at when it came to the rock and roll lifestyle from his answers to their questions. To favourite food, he answered blues, meaning amphetamines. To miscellaneous likes, he answered birds, meaning women. To professional ambition, he responded, to smash 100 drum kits. And to personal ambition, he responded, to stay young forever. And when it comes to his professional ambition to smash 100 drum kits, it seems likely he achieved it many times over. In 10 months, Keith had ruined three drum kits, had broken an average of eight sticks a night, and had cracked a cymbal once a fortnight. And it wasn't just his drum kit he destroyed either. At the road centre, Keith threw a tom-tom into the crowd and injured a girl in the audience. It wasn't actually even his drum kit he was using at the time. It belonged to Will Birch from the band Southend's Flowerpots. During the gig, Moon completely wrecked two drums and dented a cymbal. And when Will asked for reimbursement, Keith just said, why don't you bugger off? The growing tensions between Roger and the other three, but Keith in particular, came to a head in Denmark where Townsend, Entwistle and Moon were taking large amounts of drugs to help them through the gruelling schedule. Daltrey says, The show in Aalborg, that was where everything really unravelled. 
Maybe it was a combination of the drugs they'd taken and the nerves, but the show was a mess. I tried desperately to get the lyrics in and the vocal loud enough, but they just played louder and faster. It was a cacophony and something had to give. While the band smashed up the stage at the end of my generation, I stormed off stage and straight up to Keith's suitcase in the dressing room. I thought, I'm going to stop this once and for all. It took five seconds to find his stash, this great big bag full of pills in his suitcase. Black bombers, purple hearts, you name it. And I just flushed the bloody lot down the toilet. Of course, Keith came straight off stage behind me, wanting another pill. And he starts shouting, what's happened to them? What's fucking happened to them? So I told him I flushed them down the toilet. This made him angry, and he came slashing at me with the bells of a tambourine. Pete Townsend continues the story. When Keith challenged him, Roger lashed out with his fists, bloodying Keith's nose, turning what would have been a minor spat into a melodrama. One significant thing about this outburst was Keith's response. Instead of responding with humiliation, he seemed to sober up. It was clear he was about to establish a boundary that Roger could never cross again. Daltrey adds, It wasn't a bad fight, but it was a fight, and I finished it. The next day, we flew home. I was summoned to our manager's office and told I was no longer part of the Who. A meeting was called, a locked door summit that must have been the most humbling moment of Roger's life. He was given an ultimatum, no more punches, no more haranguing the others for their drug habits. Take it or leave it. So he capitulated. Roger gives a little more detail, saying, There were conditions on both sides. They'd have me back as long as I didn't beat the crap out of them or flush their stash down the bog. I'd go back as long as they didn't take drugs before a show. This was going to be professional. We were going to be the best at this. It wasn't a lot to ask. That was the deal, and they kept it well into the 70s when Keith started to take stuff on stage again. But the truth is, that's just Roger Daltrey being charitable, because it was almost no time at all before Keith and John Entwistle were breaking their end of the bargain. Keith and John were now thick as thieves, and they ended up missing the start of a gig due to drugs and booze. On Friday, May the 20th, 1966, The Who had a show in Newbury. Keith and John, however, were socialising, where they sipped a few drinks, popped a few pills, and time flew by without them realising. When they arrived at the club several hours later, it was to find Roger and Pete already on stage playing the Who set, using the rhythm section from the support band. Keith and John, extremely pissed off, took over on stage, and there was an angry exchange between Keith and Pete. During the My Generation finale, when Keith kicked over his drums, a cymbal hit Pete in the leg. Pete continues, Keith and John arrived very late and very drunk. Roger and I had been holding the fort by playing without them, which was the pattern at the time. An argument broke out on stage, and, at my wit's end, I threw my guitar at Keith. Bass player John Entwistle says, Keith said sorry to Pete, but Pete turned around and smashed him in the face with his guitar. So Keith and I left and went home, took the phone off the hook and went to see our managers to tell them we were through. Somehow, we got back together again. In those days, we were breaking up every week. In the middle of all the onstage bloodshed, the curtain came down and a voice over the PA announced with as much confidence as it could muster, don't worry, it's all part of the show. The stage fights were fairly common. One of us had either turn up late, usually me. We just generally didn't get on all that well, and uh, we used to take it out on stage because we we used to avoid each other off stage. And so all the sort of uh, all the pent up aggression would come out then. And uh, sometimes it just used to get to a flashpoint. We used to beat each other up on stage, and of course this used to make for very short shows. Uh, in fact, some of the shows we did were only about six minutes long, and then everything <laughs> used to get totaled. So I would just walk on, smash up the equipment and walk off. And it would, that would be it, you know, three minutes and that's a lot. By this time, with The Who being a success both in the charts and in the media, Keith became known for blowing outrageous sums of money in the London clubs. One of his favourite haunts was the speakeasy, where his crazy behaviour was a regular occurrence. According to Melody Maker, in January 1966, Keith Moon appeared at the popular speakeasy venue, completely naked, and then proceeded to let off all the fire extinguishers. I'm pretty much the same off stage as on. I have a very active sort of social life. I spend about, say, six days of the week clubbing and one day recovering. Now, I don't I think there's a hell of a lot of difference between me on stage and me off, really. I'm just as crazy both ways. 
Derek Timms from the Moondogs recalls, At the speakeasy, Keith used to piss on people's shoes in the middle of a conversation. Keith was now also making enough money to be co-owner of a Bentley. And it was at a different one of his London clubs that he used it to dramatic effect to generate even more chaos. Keith's delight at owning a Bentley was such that he was forever inviting fellow celebrity friends to come and admire it. On one occasion at the Scotch of St James, he insisted on borrowing the keys to do so. Reluctantly, he was given them, with strict instructions not to drive. He came back sheepishly about half an hour later. By that time, he'd wiped out a Porsche, an Aston Martin, someone else's Bentley and a Jaguar coming out of the very confined space around the Scotch. He had ripped out half of the undercarriage on the bollards, he'd pulled out and smashed across the road and left the car up on the side. After the incident, nobody ever imagined letting Keith drive ever again. And so, Keith began getting more and more destructive. It wasn't just on stage anymore, it was now starting to spread out into the backstage area and all the way back to the hotels in which they were staying. Ian Titch Amy remembers, We arrived at a dance hall in Bath once, where the toilet door in the dressing room was off its hinges. The promoter explained that that was because The Who had been there the previous week. Pete Townsend helps to pinpoint the moment that this new art form began to develop. The Who toured Europe, Britain, Sweden, Denmark, France and Germany. I remember Berlin as war-scarred and still uneasy, and it was at the Hilton there that Keith's hotel room wrecking began in earnest. John Entwistle's biography gives a little more context. After a show, most normally John and Keith would sit in the bar, chill out and have a laugh, or else go up to one of their rooms and drink till three in the morning. John and Keith would still be on that adrenaline rush, so that if they couldn't get hold of room service, or they wouldn't do sandwiches for them at that time, the phone would go out the window and the room would just get trashed. They say the quiet ones are the worst, and John was just as bad as Keith in that respect. He would smash up a room exactly the same, stick a bowie knife in furniture and rip it to bits. It wasn't long until the destruction moved on to include weaponry as well. Rich from the Tremolos remembers, We did a tour with The Who in the mid-60s. One night, Keith bought an air pistol and walked along the backstage corridors shooting out all the light bulbs. We all had to change in the dark with glass everywhere. We never knew what he would get up to next. Keith was a madman but a great bloke. The Who had officially cracked the UK, and now they had America in their sights. Come 1967, the band were in the States, and working to build their following there. And of course, out on the road, the pranks only continued to escalate. Keith's friend, guitarist Joe Walsh, recalls, Practical jokes, there were a bunch of them, lots of room trashing. I want to say good clean fun, but, you know, Keith was scary, and all the stories are true you just did not fucking know what he was going to do. In America, it was generally juvenile stuff. Water fights in the bedrooms, usually instigated and won by Keith, who had already filled the bathtub for ammunition and emptied the sand buckets from the corridors to use as water containers. On one occasion, he got the group thrown out of a hotel in Providence, Rhode Island, when he forgot to turn his bath off and flooded the floor beneath. And it was in America's deep south that Keith discovered one of the most enduring loves of his life. Cherry bombs. When the tour moved to Montgomery, Alabama in the Deep South, the hermits, who they were touring with, showed Keith the aptly named Cherry Bomb. For a proven homemade bomb expert and amateur scientist such as Keith, this was all but an invitation to mayhem. The next day, Keith bought several dozen. We tried one out on his suitcase, says John Entwistle. It blew a hole in the suitcase and the chair. So then, we decided the hotel deserves to get fucked because we'd had so much trouble with room service. Our idea was to put the cherry bomb down the toilet and flush it so we couldn't get blamed for it. Hopefully, it would blow some pipes along the way. We crouched over, Keith lit it, and I flushed it, but the cherry bomb just kept going round and round. We ran out, and as we slammed the door, the explosion went off, and there was just a hole in the bathroom floor. The toilet was completely powdered. From that moment on, no toilet or changing room was safe. Apparently, it wasn't long before Keith moved on from cherry bombs to actual mini sticks of dynamite. Reg Presley from the Trogs says, 
I was there when he blew up a hotel toilet with a bundle of mini dynamite sticks he used to carry around with him. After he'd thus caused thousands of dollars worth of damage, he rang up reception and asked, please can you bring me up another room? Another time, he rolled a fake hand grenade down the aisle of a jet and got the Who banned from ever using that particular airline again. Sometimes he'd get so sloshed that he'd tell the road crew not to disturb him under any circumstances the next morning. They'd protest that he had to be on board the tour bus for the next show, but he'd insist on lying in. So they'd go into his room, lift him gently on a stretcher, and carry him down to the bus, where he'd be laid out on the luggage rack. I mean, the, 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 the thing I remember once was we were late for a plane, we were in a car, we were driving to an airport. The airport was one of those in the States, which is like 50 miles out of town. We were halfway there. And suddenly he, he, he turned to the driver and he said, we've got to go back to the hotel. I've left something behind. I've left something. I've forgotten something. We've got to go back. We've got to go back now. So we all thought it was his passport or possibly something illicit and dangerous or something. So we, we, we quietly allow him to turn around. The car goes back. We drive back to the hotel. We wait in the car park. He comes back and he goes, OK, God, OK, we can go. So I said, what was it you forgot? He said, I forgot to smash the television. <laughs> Perhaps the most ruinous and legendary of all the Keith Moon stories from the 1967 tour of America, however, concerns the stay of the Who at the Holiday Inn in Flint, Michigan, on Keith's 21st birthday. After this event, when the band returned to the UK, Keith had a tooth missing. He would go on to claim in the press that he lost the tooth in a fight with a paratrooper back from Vietnam. The truth is, he actually lost his tooth at his chaotic birthday party at the Holiday Inn. And while many Who biographies have claimed that he actually faked his age and was really only 20, this is just a myth. He really was 21. Roger Daltrey says, If we weren't travelling after the gigs, we'd go back to these fantastic little motels. They weren't five-star by any stretch of the imagination. They were more like military barracks, but they always had a pool in the middle, and we'd always end up seeing who could jump the highest into them. Keith always won because he just went straight off the roof. The band arrived in Flint, Michigan from a tour in Canada. The band performed a reportedly average concert at Atwood High School football stadium, which was poorly attended, after which they returned to the Holiday Inn for the birthday party. Rogers says, On the 23rd of August 1967, in Flint, Michigan, Keith turned 21. He chose to mark the occasion by getting us banned from every Holiday Inn on the planet, and I wasn't even there. The next morning, I woke up to a long story and a longer bill. A drum company had delivered Keith a cake with a girl in it. It was inevitable that a food fight would get underway, and equally logical that Keith should start it. Here's Keith's version of what happened next from an interview with Rolling Stone. I'd started drinking about 10 o'clock in the morning, and I can't remember the show. The record companies had booked a big room in the hotel, one of the conference rooms, for a party. As the hours went on, it got louder and louder, and everybody started getting well out of their minds, well stoned. The pool was the obvious target. Everybody started jumping in the pool with their clothes on. The Premier Drum Company had given me a huge birthday cake, with five drums stacked up on top of each other. As the party degenerated, I picked up the cake, all five tiers, and hurled it at the throng. People started picking up the pieces and hurling it around. Everybody was covered in marzipan and icing sugar and fruitcake. And, apparently, at this point, Pete Townsend arrived. By the time I reached the party room, the cake was all over the floor, the walls and Keith's face. And it seems like Pete's arrival only triggered more mayhem. Cake was soon flying through the air, but it was when the cry came to debag the birthday boy that events got out of hand. Various members of the three bands on the tour launched themselves on Keith, pinned him to the floor, and successfully pulled his trousers down, ripping them beyond repair in the process. They got more than they bargained for, however. Keith was not wearing underpants. Keith, naked from the waist down, made a dash for it out of the room. Keith, who claims he still had his pants on, continues. The manager heard and came in, and there it was, his great carpet, stained irrevocably with marzipan and fruitcake trodden in, and everybody dancing about with their trousers off. By the time the sheriff came in, I was standing there in my underpants. I ran out, jumped into the first car I came to, which was a brand new Lincoln Continental. 
It was parked on a slight hill, and when I took the handbrake off, it started to roll, and it smashed straight through this pool surround, and the whole Lincoln Continental went into the Holiday Inn swimming pool, with me in it. Pete continues, In the swimming pool, a Lincoln Continental balanced precariously, half in and half out. Later, I heard Keith had released its brake, and it had rolled in. I was trying to get Keith back to his room, but he was raging by this time, when a young man approached, asking for his autograph. Keith threw a lamp at him, hitting him on the head. Keith continues, I went back to the party, streaming water, still in my underpants. The first person I see is the sheriff, and he's got his hand on his gun. Sod this. So I ran. I started to leg it out of the door, and I slipped on a piece of marzipan and fell flat on my face and knocked out my tooth. Keith was taken to an emergency dentist to have his tooth drilled out, and, because he was so drunk, he had to have the whole procedure done with no anaesthetic. John Entwistle went with him to the dentist, but back at the hotel, things were descending into complete anarchy. The party disintegrated into a small riot. The flashpoint was Keith's nude exposure, at which the hotel manager closed down the party and the police demanded the room empty only for various drunken members of the entourage to run rampant through the rest of the hotel. A couple grabbed fire extinguishers, others pulled snack machines from the walls. Party guests were thrown into the swimming pool, as were glasses and bottles. During the merriment, someone had upset all the fire extinguishers and turned them on the cars in the car park. Six of them had to have new paint jobs because the paint all peeled off. We'd also destroyed a piano, completely destroyed it, reduced it to kindling, and, don't forget the carpet, and the Lincoln Continental in the bottom of the pool. It wasn't until the police drew their guns that the more unruly guests were brought under control, and the party finally dispersed. Keith says, I spent the remainder of the night under the custody of the sheriff at a dentist's, and the next day I spent a couple of hours in the nick. The boys had chartered me a plane because they had to leave on an earlier flight. The sheriff took me out in the law car and he puts me on the plane and says, Son, don't ever dock in Flint, Michigan again. I said, Dear boy, I wouldn't dream of it. And Roger summed the whole escapade up, saying, The ban wasn't the end of the world. All publicity is good publicity and the ban only lasted until 1993. But the $50,000 cost of draining the pool and fishing out the Continental was... We had already shelled out a thousand dollars for entirely understandable reasons in Montgomery, Alabama, after a duty manager had made the huge mistake of asking Keith to keep the music down. Keith had responded by blowing up his toilet with a bag of cherry bombs. That, my dear boy, is noise, he told the manager, who billed us for the damage and chucked us all out. The Holiday Inn episode was in August. One month later, in September of that same year, the Who appeared on American TV. And, as always, thanks to Keith, chaos followed. My Generation had been a hit in the States, and The Who had the opportunity to perform it on the Smothers Brothers Comedy Hour. We went home via the Smothers Brothers Comedy Hour at CBS, one last chance for a final bit of publicity. Again, we have Keith to thank for that. We were due to play I Can See For Miles and My Generation, and, at the end, Keith was to set off a smoke bomb. We rehearsed our little spot in the afternoon, and it all went fine. After a lot of discussion, the studio fire marshal was happy with the extent of the planned explosion. But Keith wasn't. When hanging about after the afternoon rehearsal, Moon loaded a bass drum with flash powder, which was to be triggered at an optimum moment by his foot pedal. However, individuals from the studio staff and The Who kept packing further small quantities of powder into the cache, over the course of the hours that preceded the Who's slot. In between rehearsals and broadcast, between the first and second bottle of brandy, Keith bribed the marshal. He wanted a bigger bang. That was his motto in life, and nothing, not even live television, would stop him. And so, the band played their set, and as they built up to the finale of My Generation, Keith set off the bang, with explosive powder that had now been built up to an entirely dangerous level. What happened next was among the most anarchic and hilarious moments in music television history. Keith caused a detonation so powerful that it temporarily rendered the television cameras blind. The screen turned completely white with the shock of the explosion. Roger says, The resulting explosion knocked me several feet forward, covered the entire stage in smoke and dust, 
and interrupted the live transmission for a couple of seconds. Keith was closest to the epicenter, but he escaped with just a gashed arm. When the stage came back into focus, the air was thick with smoke. Keith himself was thrown backwards, clutching his left arm in pain, a symbol having sliced across it. Off stage, guest Betty Davis fainted into fellow guest Mickey Rooney's arms. Pete took the full force of the explosion and spent the next few minutes tamping down his burning hair. Pete says, My hair caught fire and my hearing was never the same. Keith was such a twat sometimes, even if he did make this TV show a significant moment in pop history. And now we move on to 1968, the year in which Keith Moon fell out with an entire continent. As things continued to get wilder and wilder in the live shows, in the dressing rooms and the hotels, so they began to escalate on plane flights all around the world. On plane flights, Keith would carry a can of Campbell's chicken soup on board, pour some of it into a sick bag when no one was looking, and then later pretend to have the most violent air sickness, retching noisily into the bag until he had everyone's attention, at which point he would raise it and pour the sick-like soup back into his mouth, offering up a hearty sigh of relief while innocently inquiring of his fellow passengers what they found so disgusting. As 1968 dawned, the Who travelled by plane to do a short tour of Australia and New Zealand, which would result in the band, in its original form, vowing to never play Australia ever again. Roger says, On the 20th of January 68, we arrived in Sydney for an 11-night tour of Australia and New Zealand. Pete adds, When we arrived, shattered after 36 hours of travel, we were surprised to meet an aggressive group of journalists who put us through an inquisition. Roger had taken to wearing a large crucifix at the time, and one of the reporters, clearly drunk, thought this was religious hypocrisy. I was challenged for looking unkempt. Couldn't you even brush your hair to meet your young fans? There were no young fans anywhere in sight, just these arsehole hacks fresh from a long stint at the bar. Pete opened proceedings by punching a reporter who asked him how he felt about the devalued pound. It wasn't a particularly friendly question to throw someone who had just flown 36 hours via Cairo, Bombay, Karachi and Singapore, and it all went downhill from there. The whole tour was a disaster. The sound was shit. I couldn't hear anything. The equipment was shit and it was borrowed, so they didn't like it when we smashed it up, which we did because it was shit. The press had it in for us because we were young and British, we had long hair, filthy mouths, and we were shagging their daughters. On the flight that took the band back from Adelaide to Sydney at the end of the Australian leg, an altercation with a stewardess escalated rapidly until someone called her a four-letter word, and the captain landed the plane at the nearest airport to have the entire 19-person entourage removed by force. Bobby Pridden, our sound man, had opened a bottle of beer. It turns out you're not allowed to consume alcohol when you're flying over the state of South Australia. Bobby's beer was the fuse that sparked an in-flight mini-riot. The flight attendant was uncomfortable dealing with us, and when the coffee trolley passed down the aisle, she didn't serve any of the band. When English singer Paul Jones complained, she said she thought we had our own refreshments, pointing to the Australian musician sitting next to me, happily drinking his own beer. Roger says, First of all, I heard someone, probably Steve Marriott, telling the stewardess he was fifth in line to the throne and he could do what he wanted. Then, when the captain was called, Bobby concluded their heated discussion by shouting, How dare you call me a scruffy little man when your shirt isn't even properly cleaned? Pete says, I first piped up when we were held by the police after landing. I challenged them to arrest us or let us go. They let us go. A few days later, we were handed a telegram from the Australian Prime Minister himself, informing us that because of our misbehaviour, he was withholding our tour receipts against damages. He also requested that we never again return to Australia. The news of our misbehaviour preceded us to New Zealand, where the hotel manager in Wellington warned us on arrival that he wouldn't stand any nonsense. Refused room service or even a bowl, I ate the breakfast cereal I purchased from the corner shop out of the sink. The Who vowed never to return to Australia, and it was a promise they kept. And no one came out of the experience with more resentment than drummer Keith Moon. I'm just about to speak to that fabulous pop group, The Who.
Mr. Moon, Norman Ganson uh, from the uh, Norman Ganson show. Are you Australian? Yeah, that's right. I don't want anything to do with your Australian f face. Now, will you please leave me alone, you great f I do you. Just <laughs> leave me alone, you I, oh. Well, what? Where's my dressing room? Maybe you need this. Oh, I don't know. No, I don't drink. I don't drink. This is in a heritage. You Australian slag, piss off! How did you stop paying the fortune going to your head, Mr. Moon? <laughs> Dougal, my driver and I, had great fun going up and down Charing Cross Road looking for anything in surgical pink. We spent hours and Dougal would scream, there's a jock strap in surgical pink over here. And I'd hurtle across Charing Cross Road. Eventually, you know, we had this mountain of surgical pink material and I kept it for Australia. And when I was there, when I was in Australia, I mean, the Australians described it like a jewel, like a jewel set in the middle of a park. An absolutely wonderful and, and, you know, there's this awful sort of race course in the middle of a load of fields. So we're out there, we've got two shows to do. I'm dressed up in surgical pink underneath this raincoat. I was running across all these mud and the, the raincoat came open, revealing all this surgical pink underwear, and I was in, arrested by the, the Melbourne police as a, a pervert. They took me to the police van and they had to send for the producer of the show to bail me out, you know, to say that this was, actually was a stage costume and that this is not how he normally dresses. Next, in February, the band returned to the US for a six-week tour. And there, in April, while at a dinner with their American agent in Manhattan, Keith began to boil over about their experience in Australia. Moon jumped to his feet. Fucking Australia, he cried. I hate that fucking place. Then he was up on the sofa. He was spilling his wine all over the floor as he ranted. The others tried to convince Keith that what was done was done, that they were never going to go back to Australia, and that there was no reason to ruin the night. I'm sorry, he said. I'm so upset right now that I'm making a fool of myself. If you don't mind, I'm going to go. An hour or so later, Daltrey and Entwistle returned to the Gorham Hotel, where the band were staying. The police were outside, looking decidedly uneasy. Roger takes me outside, recalls Frank, their agent, and on this ledge is fucking Moon, and he's doing this crazy laugh, and he's throwing cherry bombs down at the police. This captain says, do you know that fucking nut up there? I said, yeah, do you want me to speak to him? And he said, you'd better, because he's going to jail. So, Frank Barcelona, their American agent, quickly found the hotel manager, who was every bit as agitated as the police captain. Prior to throwing cherry bombs from his ninth floor window, Keith had blown up the toilet and, with it, the entire floor's plumbing. In the end, Frank, their American agent, got to Keith in time and convinced him, before the police got there, to make up a story about having had a bad reaction to some drugs. As he so often did, Keith was able to present his excuse so convincingly that he actually didn't end up in jail. The Who, however, definitely had to leave the hotel. Roger says, At 4am on the 5th of April, we were thrown out of the Hotel Gorham in New York. I was having a good sleep, and then I learned that Keith had thrown cherry bombs from the ninth floor window. He'd blown up a toilet and a nice old lady in an elevator. So we were all out. There was only enough time to dress, half asleep, grab my things and step out onto West 55th Street. Worse, the Gorham let every other hotel in Manhattan know what had happened, so it took until 6am to find a place far enough away and unscrupulous enough to take us. The next night we were booked at the Waldorf, a step up from the Gorham. They insisted on a cash surety. We didn't have the cash, so we were thrown out before we even had a chance to unpack. And when Keith couldn't get back into his room to retrieve his luggage, he blew the door up with the cherry bombs he had left over from the night before. We were turfed out onto Park Avenue, so that was the Waldorf, the Gorham, all the Holiday Inns, most of the Hiltons, and some of the Sheratons. During this time, due to the sheer level of destruction and chaos, the Who were having to pay out much of what they were earning in compensation and damages. And Roger Daltrey, who took part in almost none of it, was trying to save up for a deposit for a house. The plan was to come back from the American tours with a grand to put a deposit down on a house outside London. Trying to spoil the plan, of course, was Keith Moon. If 1967 was the year he discovered cherry bombs, 
1968 was the year of the superglue, the piranhas and the snake. The superglue is self-explanatory. I just feel sorry for all the hotel maids confronted with suddenly immovable furniture and toilet seats and wine glasses on the ceiling. The piranhas were John's idea. He was quiet and in the background, but he was very much a member of Keith's cohort. He had a dark side, and it was him who put the piranhas into the hotel bath. The piranha met a premature demise when the group headed to the local arena for the evening, and the bath water went freezing cold in their absence. Keith and John left it behind on the toilet seat as a present for the maid. As 1968 rolled into 1969, there were multiple milestones for The Who as a band, and of course, many more Keith Moon pranks. Cotswolds born Mick Bratby joined up with the band's crew for the 1969 tour. He and Keith used to joke about together. In Washington, they stayed at the Watergate Hotel, and Keith let off all the fire alarms at 3am. It was the next year, however, in which an event took place that sent Keith down a dark road. Now, this is just my perspective, but I kind of see Keith's story as having two distinct halves, Keith in the 60s and Keith in the 70s. In the 60s, he was a madman, but mostly just a prankster and practical joker who liked to take everything as far as it was possible to go. Within the very first week of 1970, however, an event took place that caused many things from that point on to have a slightly darker, more self-destructive edge to them. Here is a very quick synopsis from Wikipedia. On the 4th of January 1970, Keith Moon accidentally killed his friend, driver and bodyguard, Neil Boland, outside the Red Lion pub in Hatfield. Pub patrons had begun to attack his Bentley. Moon, drunk, began driving to escape them and hit Boland. After an investigation, the coroner ruled Boland's death an accident. Moon, having been charged with a number of offences, received an absolute discharge. But those close to Moon said that he was haunted by Boland's death for the rest of his life. In his darker moments, of which there were to be many from now on, Keith was painfully aware that his whole life had been building up to something like this. That he felt compelled to carry on drinking was no real surprise, given that he was already exhibiting most of the signs of alcoholism. That he should carry on looning with little regard to public safety was perhaps surprising. In Keith's suitcase, Along with spare underwear, he also had packed an axe as a way to ward off over-intrusive fans. He would also use it to reduce everything in his hotel room to half-things, former things and broken things. Keith himself said, I get bored, you see. When I get bored, I rebel. I take out my hatchet and chop the hotel room to bits. It happens all the time. If you're sitting around after a show and there's something you don't like on the TV, you just switch it off by throwing a bottle through the screen. As far as I'm aware, there's no actual video evidence of Keith in the act of trashing a hotel room, but we do have the next best thing. A reenactment he did with Steve Martin. Hi, I'm Ralph Bain speaking to you for the Hewitt House Hotels, the rock star's home away from home. Don't be alarmed. I think I know what's going on. Go right ahead, Keith. Good to see you again. <laughs> you know, a lot of you young rock and roll musicians are going to be big stars someday, just like Keith here. We know what it's like to be on tour, going from town to town, ending up in some crummy hotel like this one. Let's face it, when you get to your room, the first thing you want to do is destroy it. What the heck? It's not yours. Keith, rip some of that wallpaper off, okay? Rip it off. Notice how our wallpaper doesn't come off in easy, nice strips. It comes off in big chunks that, that we can never replace. And you know, our electrical system here at the Hewitt House Hotel, once you plug in your amplifier, it's designed to short out the entire building as a complete discourtesy to the other people. Our TV sets are loose and free because we know you rock stars do like to throw television sets into the swimming pool. Let me help you with that, Keith. Right out the window. You take the final cross, buddy. You feel a little better now, Keith? Well, yeah, I've been sluggish and depressed lately, but uh, that seems to have done the trick. Well, that's great. It was during this period that the waterbed incident occurred as well. People always, they, they say, well, Keith, you're so outrageous in hotels, you know. I mean, why, you know, why do hotels let you in? 
But I don't know if you're, if you're interested in one of my yes. hotels. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You can write yeah. a book about it. <laughs> we were in uh, Copenhagen and we were doing a show there. Uh, and I got to my room and, and I, was the, I was lucky enough to be the only member of the 32 member entourage that we carry with us to have a waterbed. And I was on the seventh floor and I phoned up my own personal boys and said, what we're going to do is to pick up this two ton waterbed, two tons of water, put it in the lift, send it up two floors, and when the lift doors open on the ninth floor, the thing is just going to come out and explode, right? What we did, you know, we, we managed to get it halfway out, and we got it out, and the, the damn thing burst. And I was, like, sitting in a chair, because I was, you know, I was saying, okay, forward, 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 you know, I don't do any manual work on the road. <laughs> <laughs> For God's sake, I'm an artist, right? So I'm saying, okay, left a bit, left, and all of a sudden the thing burst. And I'm sitting there, the water came up to there in the room. <laughs> and next thing, the water went, shoom, and the, fr the ceiling. Oh, no. In the room below, uh, I'd give them water. <laughs> and then that went through, and the ceiling in the room below that. <laughs> so when people say, Keith, have you ever smashed up a hotel room? I said, yes, well, three in one <laughs> fell swoop. <laughs> <laughs> the destruction was unbelievable. Don't worry, Pete, I'll handle this, Keith says, and he rings the desk. Hello, I want to talk to the manager. I have a suitcase here full of the most expensive stage clothes and they have just been engulfed by 4,000 gallons of water from this leaking waterbed. Not only do I demand replacement of my clothing, but also a room on the top floor straight away. Taken in by Keith's convincing indignation, the manager promptly upgraded Keith to the presidential suite. Keith hosted his 26th birthday in the suite, during the course of which he turned most of the antique furniture into matchwood. During 1972 and 1973, the Who weren't really doing anything. As well as the accidental death of his bodyguard, his marriage had also split up, so he was really gathering some downhill momentum. And a famous picture shows Keith sitting next to a champagne bottle he had apparently thrown at his wife Kim, missed and embedded into the wall. After the event, he had a picture frame fitted around the projectile. Throughout this 18-month period in which the Who hardly worked, Keith's personality shifted. His compulsive self-abuse became ever more dangerous. Keith was being hospitalised regularly, having his stomach pumped and then taking ever more dangerous cocktails of uppers, downers and alcohol, often in amounts that would usually be lethal. Eventually, he went back out on tour with The Who at the end of 1973. But by this time, he was turning to more and more extreme ways to handle his growing nerves before gigs. The group's American tour kicked off at the San Francisco Cow Palace on November the 20th. Keith was more nervous than anyone. Despite his image as the embodiment of on-stage bravado, he often threw up in his hotel room from sheer stage fright before heading to a show. Under these circumstances, upon arrival in San Francisco, he took tranquilizers. And Pete Townsend gives us a little more insight into who these tranquilizers were actually intended for. Keith collapsed on stage after taking three elephant tranquilizer pellets. I had to drag him back to his drum kit when he came around. Then he collapsed again. At first I thought he might be play acting a little. When he was conscious he made jokes and so on stage I treated the entire debacle as funny. We're just going to revive our drummer by punching him in the stomach, said Pete, in his usual sympathetic fashion. A lifeless Keith, eyes rolled to the back of his head, was carted off by the roadies and chucked into a cold shower. A doctor injected him with something and he was back on stage. This time he got to the end of Magic Bus, and then you didn't need a doctor to tell you he was out for good. We survived the night, and, miraculously, Keith did too. The next day, we found him in the hotel reception, languishing in a wheelchair. He wasn't exactly contrite. He was wearing a big grin and an even bigger fur hat he'd taken a shine to. Naturally, it came with buffalo horns. The North American tour continued into Canada, where after a gig at the Forum in Montreal, another legendary room-wrecking event took place at the Bonaventure Hotel. Roger Daltrey, as usual, was not involved. He says, On the 2nd of December, our American record company threw an after-show party at the Bonaventure Hotel in Montreal. We were playing the next night in Boston, and I had a killer sore throat, so I went to bed 
and left the rest of the band to it. And Pete, who was usually involved, tells the story of how the destruction started. Piles of room service lay all around us. At one point, some ketchup, refusing as ever to come out of the bottle, ended up on the wall. I thought it looked aesthetically pleasing. Someone should frame it, I said. Keith, agreeing, looked around the room. He took down a framed print from the wall, punched out the picture it contained, and held it up to frame the ketchup. There was applause. Agreeing that this was a far greater piece of art than the original, others in the room followed suit with their own redecoration. The vandalism quickly escalated, the Who's crew joining in on the most thorough destruction job ever undertaken on a Who tour, outside the immediate vicinity of Keith Moon's room. The tour de force came when the marble coffee table, with Moon at one end and allegedly Townsend at the other, was used as a battering ram to knock a hole in a wall. It was then, says John Wolfe, sent through the window into the swimming pool, 13 floors below. In his autobiography, Pete Townsend says it was a sofa, not a marble coffee table, that went through the window. What had started as a joke ended with a sofa being thrown out of a window into the beautiful courtroom gardens. As it exploded through the tempered glass, revealing small ponds, ferns and miniature trees in the garden, we all stood quiet for a moment. Directly opposite us was the hotel reception area behind a glass wall. The hotel staff looked at us in shock. We stared back, equally horrified as we slowly came to our senses. At four in the morning, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police arrived in force and dragged 16 of us off to the Nick. There was no point telling them I'd had absolutely nothing to do with it. You could see they were in no mood for due process. The entire group, along with 10 other immediate members of the entourage and a wide assortment of temporary female company, were arrested at gunpoint. There was only one person missing, Keith Bloody Moon. At some point, much, much later, there was a huge ruckus and in Swan's Moon in his tiger skin coat doing his best Noel Coward. He looked at the meanest buzz-cut Mountie in the room and with a dismissive wave of the hand said, Could you make mine with two sugars, dear boy? He then turned to the next Mountie along and said, I think you'll find I booked a suite. I'm sure that didn't help expedite our release. So, as we are now into the final chapter of Keith Moon's life, which was tinged more with tragedy than comedy, I want to leave you with one final fantastic story. Joe Walsh stopped in to see the band at the Navarro to find Keith, as always, living on the brink. Joe says, I got off the lift at Keith's floor and John Entwistle was hanging from the plumbing like an ape in his underwear with a bottle of brandy in his hand. I went down to Keith's room, the door was open, but he wasn't in. One window was open and on the other was an air conditioner, the window mount type, and Keith was outside, standing on top of the air conditioner, overlooking Central Park. Dear boy, he said, great guns, thank God you've come. And he invited me up there. I just said, no, I'll be in here. This air conditioner was 18 inches long by 12. I was sure he was going to fall. I saw no way how he could have got out of the window and climbed up with a glass of brandy and ginger. But he seemed to have nine lives. I mean, he did things that... I've seen Keith Moon, you know, the, the air conditioners, you don't see so many of them now that yeah. go through the window. Yeah. Right. I've seen him dancing on one of those 16 stories in the air you know, so, with a bottle so, of brandy. So he had a death wish? Like, no, he, he was just fearless. He was one of those kind of... People just had no fear of anything. Of course, we know that shortly after, Keith's vices caught up with him and he succumbed to them at a very early age. But that is the image I want to leave you with today. The comedy rather than the tragedy. Keith Moon, the wildest, maddest rock and roll star there ever was, the reincarnated Norse god of mischief, dancing on a window-mounted air conditioner with brandy in his hand, 16 floors in the air, defying death one day after another. There are, of course, so many more stories than the ones I've told in this video. Countless dozens, if not hundreds. But if you want to know more about these, you'll have to go and read or listen to one of these books for yourself. Speaking to the NME, Keith said, Fun. That's what it's all about. Fun. Everybody thinks I'm laughing at them, but I want them to laugh with me. In an interview with Fret Like Guitar, Alice Cooper said this, 30% of what you've heard about me is true, or Marilyn Manson, or Ozzy Osbourne. Everything you've ever heard about Keith Moon is true. 
and you've only ever heard one-tenth of it.